This is my whole display right here. <laughs> there, how's that? Actually, I think most of you have seen our display up there, so um, <laughs> I just grabbed a couple um, in case you haven't seen. So um, thank you everybody for coming. My name is Linnell, and I am uh, owner operator of Monmouth Meadow here in Murfreesboro. Tennessee, and uh, we're we're a new. My mother is my partner in crime here. We are a learn as we go duo that uh, discovered a few years ago in 2012 that the monarch butterflies are in trouble, and uh, we thought, well, that's something. You know, we can't save the world, but maybe we can save a monarch butterfly. You know, or something like that. So we got very much interested in it, and uh, in the meantime, we've done a lot of reading. We've done a lot of experimenting, we've learned, made a lot of mistakes, and we continue to make a lot of mistakes. So I want, uh, I don't want anyone here to think I'm an expert in anything. Um, and probably you all, uh, if I'm saying something that you have learned different, I'd like to hear that. Um, uh, before I start the presentation, I kind of like to go around and find out what brought you here, what's your interest in milkweed or what's your interest in monarch butterflies so that because I have 27 slides that I don't want to spend too much time on one that nobody's interested in so maybe could you tell us what's your draw to this talk well I want to start with uh, milkweed of some type in our yard we want to change our yard I don't know exactly which direction we're going to go with when, yeah. so you want to see what which one works best yeah. for you okay. we have bees so we're going to they they actually will get trapped in some of the uh, milkweed. Have you seen that? Like no. the little, yeah, the, the something about the flower, the little honeybees' delicate little legs will get trapped in some in milkweed. So oh, even though it does produce pollen and nectar, it's not technically that good for bees. It will kill some of them. I'm a, I, I have honeybees also. Yes, sir. Oh, I never so, saw yeah. that. Because I, what I read is that they're good for the honeybees. Yeah. They're all pollinated by never that they, they, they get caught up in those flowers, in the flowers. Mm -hmm. huh. it's it's something about about the, the way, bud yeah. like in the bud or something I, it, but the, well anyway it traps them and they just can't get their foot out essentially oh. from the flower as they're walking around so they'll just starve oh. they'll die like that so, oh, that's so sad. I, I would plant something else for the bees is what <laughs> i'm trying to say monarchs yes but the bees oh. anyway <laughs> go ahead Sorry. yeah no that's fine that's why this is exactly what i wanted to try to get going before I do this. Okay, so that helps us in I'm my garden. I'm trying to get the butterflies in my garden. Into your garden, uh, particularly monarch butterflies. I'm hoping when I saw you were going to make sure I was hoping y'all be selling me some milkweed. Yes, because I read the milkweed is what I needed. Right, right. So I spent a lot of money to get the I know! <laughs> I lost a <laughs> So thank you very much, and the monarch butterflies, thank you. You will. Uh, these are wonderful. These are made of recycled paper. You can buy them at the Wilderness Station here at Barfield Crescent Park. And it's not just the monarch and the caterpillar. They have all sorts of, what were they? Oh, there's like hurdles and I don't know. I mean, any kind of animal that you love. And even guys, you know, you can wear earrings now, you know, this is 2015, right? So what brings you to um, I'm new to gardening, um, but I, I really enjoy seeing all the different things that come out, like the yeah. butterflies and the bees and stuff. Well good, this would be a great new project for you yeah. because it's not so difficult. And, and, and it produces a lot of good outcome, you know, for the pollinators, except maybe not the honeybees. <laughs> and, and then for us, you know, because we're losing a lot of our, our food source, about a third of our food source is due to pollination. And so if we don't keep those here, I'm so happy that we got some beekeepers here. So, yay. <laughs> And I'm Cheryl, I'm from West Tennessee, and I am a volunteer at the Tennessee National Wildlife Refuge, and we're in the process of trying to plant milkweed and establish a monarch way station, probably at some time in the future. We're just a new facility, and we've trucked in 4,000 school students to educate them about wildlife and why we preserve wildlife and ecology and so on, so I'm here to 
takes the information home. Good, and she, she talked about a Monarch Way Station. That's actually an activity through Kansas University that I don't have in this slide presentation. I have done presentations on it because we also work, uh, we are considered uh, citizen scientists for the, for the university and that we tag Monarchs, we raise Monarchs and then we tag them in the fall for Monarch University and then they, they track them to make the killing back. So that's another, Another presentation, but awesome that you're here. Anyway, we're along the Tennessee River, all the way from I 40 to almost the Kentucky border. Yeah. We're in a pretty unique path for these so moments, which you'll see later. We're on the Mississippi Flyway for the ducks and the oh, migratory okay. birds. So. So are you here just as a tech or? No, Edwina asked me to film it. Oh, I'm okay. filming all the classes today. Oh, all right. I'm, I'm one of the Rutherford County Master Gardens. Oh, so. wonderful. Yeah. Okay, good. So he may be able to add some to the talk too. <laughs> and are you guys here just because you're my friends? Or well, you... that's a third of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just wanted to learn whatever else I can learn to attract the butterflies and, yeah. and help save the world. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, what, that's why I'm here. Because okay. I've, you know, I've got the one milk weed and yeah. the butterfly bushes. Yeah. I try to plant things that attract bees. And right. So anything you do for the monarch butterfly, you do for most of the other pollinators. Um, I, that's just the first time I heard about the four honeybees. I'm feeling a little I'll bad, but honestly, I've never seen a honeybee on any of my milk hmm. Um, I did see one in my uh -huh. yard already on um, some clover yeah, yeah, this too. spring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how about you? I'm a master gardener. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the garden over here. Yes. Like it's, a, it's a monarch station. It is. It's a monarch way station out here. I'm hoping to attract a couple of my gardeners. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I came uh, after in the fall, they had seed pods left, so I came and got some of your seed pods <laughs> with permission. I didn't have to do yeah. And how about you? I'm Carrie Davis, I'm a master gardener also. Here in Rutherford County? Uh -huh. okay. yeah, I'm volunteering today. Oh, okay, great, great. And, um, I love them, they're helping out on arcs. And, yeah. Well, good, so we sort of have a, a a common goal here. I'll go ahead then. Give me an idea which slides I should skip and which I should go on. So uh, the title of this talk is Milkweeds, How, and then I had it, and Why, uh, to grow them. Um, the first reason, and I'm going to go into why instead of how. We'll do how towards the end of the talk. Um, if you plant milkweed, they will come. Okay, it's a magic, and I don't know why, but I planted milkweed in places where people have never, ever, ever, ever seen a monarch butterfly, and that, you know, once it flowers, they come. A female will come, and she will, hello, she will come, and she will uh, oviposit, which is uh, placing her eggs underneath the leaves, and then soon you'll have caterpillars. I don't, I don't know if they can smell it, you know, I don't know the science behind how they can locate milkweed in places that have never had milkweed before, but they can. Um, and in addition to that, so well, hummingbirds, honeybees, there's your honeybee, <laughs> on, that's green antelope corn. Jeez, I hope he doesn't get stuck in there. Uh, yeah, and other uh, pollinators, including wasps and things that maybe we don't really like that much, but uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful plant. I wish whoever named it had not put the word weed in it. It really is a wildflower. There is one variety um, as, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Justin. As Justin had said, uh, the common milkweed that is a bit pushy. Some people call it invasive, other people call it pushy, but all the other milkweed behaves like a wildflower. It is not pushy, it's not invasive, it doesn't, uh, it, it's, in fact, the native ones are quite difficult to grow, so if you have a stand in them, consider yourself fortunate. Um, there's more why, <laughs> you know, those commercials, but wait, there's more. Yeah, I, I was on that mood when I did this. Um, this is, for me, the biggest reason that I'm doing all of this. Um, I don't make money selling milkweed or anything, I just kind of make even there. For me, the biggest reason is because um, North America, and even more specific to North America, 
east of the continental divide of the Rocky Mountains is the only place on planet Earth where monarch butterflies migrate. It's the only place. And they not only migrate, they migrate over 3,000 miles, and they not only migrate over 3,000 miles, they do it over four to five generations. Scientists still don't know how that fourth or fifth generation knows where to go because they're the only animal that does that. All the other migrating animals teach their young, and so they're gonna know. The young know how to get back there because they were taught. But the, the monarchs that are in the Chokan right now, this blue circle here, um, are, should be leaving soon, and some hopefully have already left. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, they will fly about up to the Mexico, Mexican Texas border, and they will deposit their mate, they will deposit their eggs, and that group will die. And the next group uh, take about a month, about 28 days, to become an adult butterfly. They will continue, and that's the generation that we should see about the end of April and then throughout May. We'll see that generation if they survive this storm uh, that we had in March. Um, and then they'll stay with us. Now, Tennessee is a really interesting location in this migration because many of our monarchs will continue on north up to Canada, but we're right on the border of the summer breeding territory. So we, some of our monarchs might stay you know, depending on how much food you have available for them. Um, so uh, we're kind of a critical stake in the health of the fall migration, because if we don't have enough food for them, then the numbers could be quite a bit lower. Uh, so then they head on up, and the third generation spends their time from Tennessee up all the way to southern Canada and then they spend a wonderful summer there and in about September uh, they, they breed again. There can be another generation there and then that generation comes into Tennessee heading back down to Michoacan. So we will get what's called the pre-migration monarchs in the fall, September, October. They call it pre-migration because um, and some, science, some people who don't live in Tennessee will say, no, 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 they don't breed. Once they leave Canada, they don't breed again, but they don't live in Tennessee. And I've been doing this for three years. The monarchs that come to Tennessee breed and produce eggs in September and October. Um, so it's, uh, other scientists call it a pre-migration generation, usually the fifth generation. And then our monarchs, the ones that survive the wasps and the technoflies, um, then go down to Mexico. Now each of those generations live about 30 days a month, except for the generation that makes it to Mexico. That generation lives for five to eight months. They hibernate and live five to eight months without food or water. It's to me a very incredible. All right. So, this is the bad news. It's good news and bad news, okay? Um, we have been steadily, I, I came back to the US, I'm an international educator and I lived and worked in China and the Philippines for 14 years and, and um, I lost my brother in 2011 accidentally and so I thought, you know, I need to come back to family. So I came back <coughs> here and there was an article in the Daily News Journal that said, well, we lost 60% of our monarch population. I don't know who wrote the article. I wish I did. I want to thank them because it set me on a journey. <laughs> and so I thought, well, that's why I was telling you. We said, well, let's plant some, let's find out what we can do. And so we planted milkweed. We had a lot of butterflies that first year, but even so, we were just one person and it dropped another 60% in the winter of 13 14. Okay. And the way they measure these, they measure them in Mexico by uh, how many hectares of land they occupy in the uh, Oyamelo fir forest in Michoacan, Mexico. Because they're packed so hard in those trees so close that they can't count actually the, the number of butterflies. A, monarch butterfly, a single monarch butterfly weighs about as much as a paper clip, but if you ever see pictures of them 
when they're overwintering in Mexico, there's so many on a branch that the branch of that evergreen tree uh, looks like it's gonna break because there's so many packed together. And then we had this really good news this year. We had enough citizen scientists, folks interested like you and me, that planted milkweed in what they call the corridor from Mexico up to Canada, that we had a big jump. And we were all really excited. Except that, uh, where is it? Hold on, let me go. Except this happened on March 9th this year. And so now we're all really worried because um, we don't know what the result. There was a big, big storm, just like what happened. I'm gonna go back. Was that snow or? That was snow and ice. So what happened is they had a big rainstorm and monarchs can handle that, but then it froze and, they, and then it snowed and they can't handle getting frozen. So the reports that I've been reading yesterday, the latest, still they don't know the effect. I'm hearing anywhere from 1.5 million to 11 million dead, um, and they just fall from the trees and drop down. So this could, looked hopeful, but it's probably not realistic, because now we don't know. I'm still planting lots of milkweed, because I'm hoping at least a male and a female got out, and, it, and can breed, you know, and can lay eggs, because if one female can lay 400 eggs in her lifetime. Um, there's sort of a, I'm just gonna go over this quickly, there's kind of an argument about whether or not we should put the monarch butterfly on the threatened and endangered list. Some scientists say yes, some say no. If we do, then we can't grow, we can't handle milk, uh, we can't handle monarch butterflies anymore. I can't have them tagged, I can't have my students tag them things. So I'm on the pro don't put them on the endangered list. Let's do as much as we can. Some other people say, yeah, we should. Here's the problem. Endangered means they don't, there's a possibility they won't exist anywhere on planet Earth. And the monarch butterfly itself is not endangered because you see we have a good population in Australia and New Zealand, we have a little bit over on the west coast of Africa. Hawaii has a lot, Hawaii has black and white monarch butterflies, a beautiful kind of butterfly. And then of course, in, in North America and parts of South America, they have monarch butterflies. So the creature itself is not endangered. Uh, what is endangered is what I told you, uh, their migration right here in our part of North America. It doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. It's gone on for 20,000 years. And so if we don't plant milkweed, this is the phenomenon we will lose. Whether we could reestablish it by, by bringing in other monarchs from Australia or something, I don't know. I've, I've asked actually, and they say, you know, each the monarch develops an immune system just like we do, a cord that's regional. And so if we brought monarchs from New Zealand, they, we don't know that they could handle you know, North America, blah, blah, blah. So, so that's why we're doing this. Um, not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide. This man is uh, Professor Chip Taylor out of Kansas University. And we have his flyers on our table out there. If you wanted to go deeper into what are the whys this is happening and, and that sort of thing, it's a wonderful website called Monarch Watch. Uh, you can even order milkweed from them uh, if you can't get it from me. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but basically, it's it's weather, it's um, land development, it's um, chemicals, and then in Mexico, it's illegal logging. But we we all have a, we're all guilty in a way, and, and we're all working to to fix it in a way as well. So yeah, this is my sad, sad picture, and I just cried when I saw it. Um, they're still frozen to the tree. When it thaws, if they die, they'll just fall off to the ground. If they survived it, they'll continue to hang, and we don't know the outcome of that yet. So what can we do about it? And it's really easy. It's plant milkweed. That's it. Um, the thing is, we just have to find 
different places to plant it because it used to just sprout up. The native milkweed would sprout up in our, our fields, our corn fields and soybean fields. But we've developed, and we need to, we have to have houses to live in. Uh, but we can plant milkweed uh, in our gardens. The thing about using milkweed, it's a beautiful landscaping plant. It's very tall, it's about this tall. But it, it needs to be in a garden that doesn't have pesticides and herbicides because there will be seepage into the roots and the caterpillars can become deformed and if they, sorry, if they make it through